And so this is, this is work that was um, done originally by the famous Hubel and Weasel, uh, and they characterize, and many people since then have characterized the receptive fields of those retinal ganglion cells. Okay, so this is simple, but also slightly subtle. So let's fasten your seat belts for a, for a moment. I'm gonna describe two different kinds of retinal ganglion cells. One called an on-center ganglion cell, one called an off-center retinal ganglion cell. Okay? Okay. So we're gonna consider what happens when over time we change a stimulus like this. Okay, so we're gonna start at time zero with a uniform display like this. The dots are not shown to the animal. They're just to show you the properties of the receptive field. Okay, so this is uniform gray. And then at time one, in a little step function, a spot of light is gonna be presented in the center. And then at time two, it's gonna go back to uniform gray. Okay, and we're gonna look at what those neurons do with that stimulus when that stimulus is presented in their receptive field, in the part of the world they care about, okay? So here's what an on-center retinal ganglion cell does. This is the action potentials recorded from that axon in the optic nerve coming from a retinal ganglion cell. And what you see is a whole bunch of action potentials when the light is on. They start like that, they're, off, they're mostly off, some background finder, firing before and after, whole bunch of firing. What do you notice here? What's going on there? Yeah, we just saw that with the fading of those rings. Here you see a neural version of that. It responds to the light onset, but even within that short period, it's already starting to adapt over time, okay? All right, what does the off-center cell do? Its background firing rate was pretty low to begin with, so it didn't have far down to go, but it went down as far as it could go. It shut off, okay? So this tells you that a receptive field can operate in either direction. You put light in there and it can increase the firing in an on-center cell, or it can decrease the firing in an off-center cell. Everybody cool with this? That's a good question. I don't exactly know. There probably is a way to map them. I believe that the optic nerve um, preserves the retinotopic structure of the retina so that in a cross-section there would be a bit of a map. That's probably just to help developmentally, otherwise how are you gonna get it to work at the next stage? I know that where they land at the next stage that we'll talk about shortly, there is a retinotopic map and it follows up to, the, to V1, so there probably is in the cross section, um, but I, I'm not sure, if you send me an email, I will look into that, yeah? And so how a physiologist, my guess is they just stick it in there and fish around. That's how most physiology works. That there probably be a way to guide it more precisely, but it's gonna be, you know, it's pretty small you know, a millimeter or two, it's probably easier to just fish around and find it, yeah? I'll show you um, physiologists fishing for receptive fields in a second, okay? Okay, so now um, let's consider what happens when you put a darker spot. So we started with uniform gray background, now we're gonna put a darker spot in the center of that receptive field. And what you find is these cells do the opposite. The on-center cell says, oh, that's darker, I'm gonna respond less until it goes away, then it recovers, right? Because that's an on over there, right? Um, and the off-center cell responds more. Okay, everybody got this? So this is cool. It's telling us that these, um, these neurons like changes over time in both directions, up and down, in the light that's presented in the receptive field, okay? But they also like changes over space. So we've only looked at what happens when you change the light up or down right in the center, but what happens when we change the surround, the little bit around the center of the receptive field? So here's a case where we're gonna start the same as here, present a light in the center, and then make a bigger patch of light, okay? And what happens? The on-center cell responds when light is put in the center right there, but then when you put light in the whole area, it shuts off. So what's going on there is that surround, that annulus around the center is suppressing the response, okay? That's, it's kind of tiny print here, but that's what this diagram is here, is on center, off surround. Not just activation from the center, positive response to light, but negative response to light in the periphery. So that neuron is interested in spots of light of a given size, this size, not that size. Make sense? So that neuron, how is that neuron gonna respond if the animal is looking at a completely uniform white wall? Yeah, it'll be off because the surround is gonna cancel the center. 
Make sense? So these neurons respond to changes over time, when light goes up or down, and they respond to changes over space, spots of a given size, not uniform illumination. Why does that make sense? If you were designing a visual system, why would that be something to consider? Would you design a visual system that way? That's true, that would be useful. You could do that in the retina or you could do that later. But given this, never mind the sizes, just given this, why would we want to set up cells with these complicated receptive field properties, both the center and the surround differing for, from each other and the temporal properties? Think about what these neurons are doing. They're detecting changes, changes in time, changes in space. Think about what you want your brain to know about. Do you need your brain to know there's nothing here, 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 there's nothing here. That's a lot of action potentials for not much. Wouldn't it be more efficient if your brain just told you, oh, there's a spot here, or light just changed over time right here? It's differences over space and time. That's where the information is in an image, right? And so we can save a lot of action potentials. Action potentials are metabolically expensive sending all those signals up, all that nothing, 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 nothing. That's a lot of action potentials. That's a lot of metabolic activity. That's a lot of glucose, right? Um, you don't want to do that if you don't have to. So um, this is something that machine vision has also discovered. There are ways of making efficient visual codes, reducing the data to contain the same information without representing nothing, 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 nothing. And that's already being computed in your retina. Does that make sense? How changes over space and changes over time, that's where that's what you need to know, okay? So it's a very efficient code. That's how you can go from 100 million photoreceptors to a million retinal ganglion cells, because you've retained most of the critical information in that efficient code that you've computed with these very simple little um, receptive fields that are all, I left out the details, but these are all computed within the retina, within all those complicated diagrams that I skipped over. Okay, make sense? All right. Um, Okay, so that's called surround suppression or center surround organization, when the surround antagonizes the center, nullifying it, giving you spatial change, giving you an, an indication of where there's a change over space. Okay, and of course the opposite neurons kind of do the opposite. Not much because they were already low, but um, they get suppressed there. 